friend, I have been on a journey of husbandry. I went primarily to see at first hand conditions in the drought state. I shall never forget the fields of wheat, so blasted by heat that they cannot be harvested. I shall never forget field after field of corn, stunted, earless, stripped of leaves, for what the sun left, the grasshoppers took. No cracked earth, no blistering sun, no burning wind, no grasshoppers are a permanent match for the indomitable American farmers and stockmen and their wives and children who have carried on through desperate days and inspire us with their self-reliance, their tenacity, and their courage. It was their father's task to make homes it is their task to keep these homes, and it is our task to help them win their fight. Soil health is very important not only for farmers, but for the consumer and the general public because we all like to eat, and I don't think any of us are going to volunteer to give that up anytime soon. There's just Example after example of civilizations that their decline has been in large part because they've ruined their soils. They've let their soils erode. The productivity of their country has washed away into the rivers and then they're no longer able to feed themselves. And so from a social standpoint, soil health is incredibly important in order just to sustain our ability to feed not only ourselves, but to feed the world. That's why it's really important for the continued productivity of this country, not only for our generation, but for future generations. That importance then kind of leans over into what is the public perception. And I would say right now, the public doesn't really have a good understanding of soil health. And I can say that because I don't think a lot of farmers have a really good understanding of soil health. Regardless of whether you're organic or conventional or no-till or anything in between, it all has to start with the soil. Even farmers that went to college and took a soil science class, that's mainly all dealing with the physical and chemical properties of the soil. Hardly ever talked about the biological component. And that's what is really missing from a proper understanding of soil health is how important the biology is. The soil is a living organism. If you think about a really healthy soil, there's about 10,000 pounds of biological material below that soil surface. Everything from fungi to bacteria, earthworms, everything else in between. And you total them all up, that 10,000 pounds is about the same as two African elephants. If you imagine two elephants, it takes a lot to feed them. So if you have that much biological activity below the soil surface, it's going to take a lot to feed those as well. From now until 2060, we're going to have to produce as much food as we've produced in the last 500 years. What we eat, other than what comes out of the oceans, is all derived from soil. Soil security is equal to food security. So if we want to make sure that we can feed the world's population, we're going to have to understand how do we make sure that our soil has the capability of producing these crops. I'm Keith Burns, the president and co-owner of Green Cover Seed uh, here in Bladen, Nebraska, uh, co-owner along with my brother Brian. We've been farming here all of our lives and this land we intend to be able to hand down to our children and grandchildren and so soil health has always been something that's I guess been important to us uh, but probably only since about 2008 have we really you know consciously been making uh, efforts to, to, to really drastically improve it. The atmosphere around us is 78 percent nitrogen but it's unavailable to plants. So this legume plant can't actually take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and utilize it. But what it can do is it can host a very specific type of bacteria on its roots. That's actually 
colonies of rhizobia bacteria that are able to take the atmospheric nitrogen, convert it into forms of nitrogen that a plant can use, and they basically will then sell it or trade it to this plant in exchange for carbon. Plants, through photosynthesis, produce the carbon. So what we see going on here is a very complex economy going on within the soil where plants are using carbon as a currency to purchase goods and services from the bacteria, from the fungus in the soil, really from all of the biology, but in this case, uh, they're purchasing nitrogen from these bacteria in exchange for the carbon. And that's the whole key to this soil health system. It's, it's really all about the carbon. So carbonomics is a term that hopefully will get people thinking in an economic frame of mind, but using carbon as the currency. And if we could get farmers to think in terms of carbon, or at least understand that carbon is even more important than nitrogen, then the only way to get carbon into the soil is to have a growing plant. You gotta have photosynthesis. If I want more carbon, I have to have plants growing more often. So I can't just have corn and soybeans growing from May through September, I've got to have a cover crop growing from October through April. And that's where I get the big extra boost of carbon into my system. I've seen great soil health in both organic and conventional settings. I've seen terrible soil health in both conventional and organic settings. Really it comes down to the management practices and, and how the farmer is going to integrate the principles of soil health into their operation. Cover crops are simply crops planted between your cash crops that aren't really planted to be harvested necessarily. They're just there to try to put carbon back in the soil, to utilize sunlight during times of year that our cash crops are not, to protect the soil you know, by providing a living cover to, to shield the soil from erosion. The soil is a living, breathing system. Sometimes we have to feed it a little for it to feed us. And it's like a relationship. If you're in a relationship where all you do is take, 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 and you take the maximum you can at every opportunity, what are the odds of that relationship lasting very long? I'm very, very cautious and conscientious about working the soil, um, not working it too much, trying to put as much organic matter back into the soils through cover cropping as I can. My philosophy is that if I take care of the soils, the soils are going to take care of the vegetables. So I do a lot of cover cropping on the farm, um, on bare ground, if at all possible I have cover crops on it. I do a lot of cover cropping interplanting um, with crops to like bring in beneficial insects. I use a lot of mulch, like as you can see all the straw that's in between the beds. There's a lot of different components that are involved in creating and maintaining healthy soils. From out here, are you done? I got one left. Next is bok choy. And we're gonna do the bok choy next, and it's out in field E. Lettuce, 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 lettuce. Massive heads of lettuce under there, up, and here we go. Holy moly, they are so gorgeous. Oh my gosh. The heads that you would see at the grocery store are half this size. We're gonna harvest a lot of them. This is my seventh year of farming. I had a ton to learn. I mean, I didn't know anything about farming and raising produce and soil health. And, and, and I still feel like I still do have a ton to learn. The CSA model of farming is why I started farming. And it's what made me passionate about farming. It stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Hi. Yeah. How are you? Good. So I have members that pay up at the beginning of the year. They pay an upfront fee in exchange for their income to support the farm. My guarantee is that for 24 weeks, the spring, summer, and fall season, that I will provide seven to nine different items in their CSA share that they get every week.
people are starting to care about and think about where their food is coming from and care about the connection between the person that's growing the food and the food that they're eating. I look at it as a responsibility for me to try to educate my CSA members. You have to start with the big picture before you get into the minutia of soil health. You can't start with why it is that I plant cover crops and the goals that I'm trying to get out of cover cropping. I have to start with this gorgeously beautiful Swiss chard that I bring to the farmer's market and they look at it and go, oh my God, how did you do that? I just, I know that cover cropping is helping to benefit the soils, but it's not something that you're gonna see in a year or two. Building soil is not something that happens quickly. It takes a long time. I mean, when you think about when the glaciers came down like hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that's why we have the soils that we have. We're a certified organic uh, vegetable farm. The whole farm is certified, um, but I'm growing vegetables on about seven acres. If you have a lot of land, you can take an entire field out of vegetable production and just have it in a cover crop or a couple of cover crops for the year, and then next year plant it in vegetables. I don't have that much land. So for me, it's really tricky moving things around. So I, I do a lot of intercropping. One of the most common intercropping things that I do is with a fall brassica crop, I put buckwheat in the pathways and buckwheat, when it flowers, brings in a parasitic wasp, and that wasp feeds on aphids. And aphids are about the biggest pest on fall brassica crops. I'm doing a lot of sort of IPM pest control on the cash crop that I'm growing just by planting this buckwheat that's kind of in between the pathways. My dad started with five acres and we built from there. He built up to 60 acres when he was alive and then I built it up to 120 since he passed away. He's a great farmer for his time, but in his time, the fieldmen would come out from the canneries, he'd say, you need to spray this, you need to spray this on this time, even if there was bugs present, you know, harmful bugs present or not, you had to do it. That's totally changed now. There are field agents out there now with corporations that really understand that there are other methods of controlling the bad bugs using good bugs, et cetera. And so I think that's been a really major shift over the past, I'd say 20 years, which is really beneficial to the consumer. That message, in my opinion, has got to come from the farmers right to the general public. And that's what we try to do at our farm stands is, is inform them of how we do things and why we do it. And, uh, and to let them know that, that the food that we provide for them is very, very safe. How's it going? Good, how are you? Hey. I got broccoli. See? See what I'm saying? He's asking for broccoli. I got some already. A part of the job of a, of a farmer that, that sells directly to the public is changing public perception or correcting public perception as to what farmers really do. By and large, most of farmers understand that, that soil health is critical to their business. The saying that I like to use is, I'm not really treating the plant, I'm treating the soil. If you treat the soil right and take care of the soil, your crops will come. Our model is 40 different crops. We're always rotating crops around, and, and like I only like to put crops in one patch of soil for three years, and then I automatically rotate it out, whether it's berries, vegetables, or whatever. We plant different varieties of cover crops depending on what's going to be the, the succeeding crop coming up. For instance, we raise a lot of corn, and it takes a lot of nitrogen. So in fields that are going to be going into corn uh, the preceding year, then we go ahead and, and plant an Austrian pea in there, which will fix its own nitrogen. So we have a strong, good nitrogen source in the soil prior to planting and seeding the, the corn crop. And we can really reduce the use of synthetic fertilizers and also just makes the soil much healthier. Very expensive seed costs, but now when you take it the full length of the year and look at the fact that that Austrian pea is actually adding 40 to 50 pounds of nitrogen, then you got to figure out, well, what's that saving me in fertilizer costs? Well, corn takes about 120 pounds per acre of nitrogen to really get it to full production and a, a full crop. So I'm cutting my fertilizer bank in half. So I'm only using half the amount of fertilizer that I normally need to use. Then suddenly Austrian pea isn't so expensive. 
there's a value in that, but there's another value in that is less time for me in the field making sure fertilizer is being applied at the appropriate time because it's just there already. And then in other parts of soil that like came out of corn or came out of berries where there's excess nitrogen already in the soil, we'll plant more of a cereal rye variety cover crop because that's a really good absorbing and holding nitrogen in the plant during the winter time. And then we can, we can plow that under in the springtime before planting other crops. I keep my farm stand open pretty much year round and keep feeding different crops into that. And then that builds my customer base and more and more people come by. I think we need large corporate farms to feed America, but I think we feed society with farms like mine. So five fifty, please. A farm is a business, so yield matters and productivity matters, and I fully believe, and I'm sitting up here today because I believe that soil health is, is crucial to productivity, short and long term. I think there's a, a deeply engaged set of consumers that is growing. It's a consumer base that's growing, and I think what they're trying to tell us as a big food company is that food isn't a zero-sum game. As I think about what I heard today, I was blown away by the amount of science. And I know that the science has been there and the research is good, but I was really impressed. And then came this talk of how do we link the science and what we know to creating the economic models that give producers a chance to move forward with some level of confidence. That has to happen. Food alone is not going to drive this. And I just used the corn crop as an example. We grow about 15 billion bushels of corn in this country. Five of it goes in your gas tank. Five of it goes into cows. Two of it goes on ships to somewhere else. You put two of it in the grain bins. I think that leaves us with one. Food seed residual. We're not using a billion bushels of corn to make cereal and tortillas in this country. So if you think about who plays and who benefits from soil health, we all benefit. We're an urban farm in the Dutchtown neighborhood of St. Louis. We are seven miles south of the arch as the crow flies. We have about 70 to 80 varieties of cut flowers that we grow during our season. We're farmer florists, so that means we grow the flowers here and then we design the arrangements for things like weddings, funerals, parties, all that kind of stuff. This is really unusual to have an acre city farm in the heart of St. Louis. We're just wanting to be good stewards of the land. We wouldn't want to be doing anything else. That's why we bought this property, because up the street, they wanted to turn this into a parking lot. When a house is approved for demolition, they don't take away everything, right? They put it into the basement, into the foundation, and then they cover it up with maybe a foot of fill dirt, definitely not topsoil, right? So when we acquired these properties that had houses on them and were demolished, there's no way to till. It's full of rubble um, and bricks, and the soil quality is really low. We're just talking fill dirt, like Missouri clay, yuckity yuck yuck. So what we do is we bring in some soil sometimes. Instead of trying to till in, we're building up. Soil health is really vitally important here on our urban farm. Even though we're just on an acre, we're pretty committed to taking crops out of production, um, and, and replenishing the land with cover crops. So in the back, what we have are the daikon radishes, which run deep into the soil to penetrate and break up any hard pans. The cover crops are also important to um, help prevent erosion because especially on the purchase lots, we have to buy that soil, you know, so we want to hold on to it <laughs> as much as we can. We do our soil testing yearly um, and each year it provides us new information and we just tweak it a little bit more. With organic farming, you just kind of get in this mode of like more compost, more compost, right? Just keep adding compost. And we were doing that. And then our soil test would come back with really high phosphorus, right? Which can happen from just adding tons of compost. It's really hard on me because I'm really <laughs> tempted to add compost every fall, but you know. It really improved the soil. I mean, it was amazing, right? It was amazing. 
This bed last year, we had terrible problems with it. So that was from the trucked in soil that we had purchased from an area company. It was so low in nitrogen coming to us that, you know, and we had to compost and we, <laughs> we thought we'd be good to go. The entire area failed. That's when we had to be more proactive about how we're taking care of our soil. For me, it's so important, you know, I mean, just think about it. Whenever you get someone a bouquet, the first thing they do is what? They put their face in it, right? I mean, they put their face in it to smell the flowers. So if you're doing that act of love, why not go that extra step in making sure that, that it's the healthiest thing that they could possibly buy on the face of the earth? People who are really into growing sustainably and holistically are passionate. And that's what you should be looking for. A farmer who's excited about what they're doing and what they're growing. Remember the lessons of the Dust Bowl. That those images haunt us. We want to keep the soil in place. We want to take care of this earth and keep it moving after we're long gone. I think people really are starting to be aware that something is wrong with our environment, with the planet, with, with where we're living. And if we don't start taking care of it now, it's just not gonna get any better. One quote from Teddy Roosevelt that challenges each of us to think about our actions and the commitment to soil health now and into the future. If in a given community, unchecked popular rule means unlimited waste and destruction of the natural resources, soil, fertility, water power, forest, game, wildlife generally, which by right belong as much to subsequent generations as to the present generation, then it is sure proof that the present generation is not yet really fit for self-control, is not yet really fit to exercise the high and responsible privilege of a rule which shall be both by the people and for the people. The term for the people must always include the people unborn as well as the people now alive, or the democratic ideal is not realized. We're the fourth generation on this farm. Uh, my kids and my brother's kids uh, would be the fifth generation. It's been in our family for well over 100 years. We're all very much attached to the land. One thing we've noticed through soil testing is that over the years, our, our organic matter got drastically low, less than 2%. And, uh, and, and so when you start reaching those particular levels, you just don't have the water holding capacity that the ground really needs to have. And so we made the decision um, really is about five, six years ago, in talking with my brother, that we really needed to do something different. We made that conscious decision to really get into cover crops and really start building this organic matter back. First two years, we had drought and, and it really didn't take well for us. Third year, we had a home run with it. And that kind of solidified in our mind that we really needed to continue with this. We consistently see better yields with crops in, in that area. And it's just really, it's a function of the ryegrass with its root structure and if its water holding capacity, because uh, we have had the dry years through here. But then also we've seen uh, just you know better water absorption during when we do have those moments of uh, heavy downpours. One of the things that we're learning more and more how to do is become better observers. Our forefathers were were great observationists. They had PhDs in it, and with as fast times that we have today, we really don't take the time to notice changes in, in the environment. And I think we're seeing a lot more because we're taking more time to observe what's really going on around us. A lot of people call the microbes 
sort of the black box. It's, it's the unknown territory, and there's so little that we know, but we understand that they're very important in soil ecology. Most people can count up to 150 in about 30 seconds. So if you were to sit down and try to count all the microorganisms in this tablespoon of soil, without stopping and having absolutely no breaks, it would take you about six and a half years. People know that legumes are nitrogen fixing plants, but what they don't always know is that it's really the microbes that are associating with the legumes that are doing the nitrogen fixation. Without the microbes, the plants aren't gonna be, be healthy. And so just understanding that link between the microbial community and the plant is something most people aren't aware of. We think of the DNA of the soil microorganisms as their genetic potential. Because they have the potential doesn't mean that they're performing that function. So an analogy would be just because you have a bicycle doesn't mean that you're riding it. And it's the same thing with soil microorganisms. They have the genetic potential through their DNA to perform a certain function, but they may or may not be doing that. And so we need to find methods that focus on what the microorganisms are actually doing in the soil. We have a lot of risks in terms of our food supply and, and making sure that we manage all of that and keep it sustainably moving forward by regenerating the soils that are having issues right now is so critically important. Every producer, every, every rancher, every farmer out there is ultimately a livestock rower. Now, whether you know that or you don't, you've got livestock, they're just microscopic. And that's what keeps our system moving, producing, functioning as that vital living ecosystem to provide everything that we need as a human race in order to survive. Hello. Howdy. Hi, Lee. Good to see you again. Your hospitality. Oh, well, awesome. my pleasure. Anybody tell me what temperature microbes really like? Where are they at their peak efficiency? Come on, agronomy majors. Hmm. We need to adjust the curriculum, it sounds like. <laughs> 75 degrees, they're just like us. When it gets colder or hotter, they start to slow down and get lazy and not want to work. So, anybody tell me what the temperature is likely to be in a bare soil tillage system? It's not uncommon to see that get up over 100 degrees. What happens to microbial activity at that point? Done on vacation, not doing anything. What is the temperature in that same field if we've got a, a rye thatch laid down? We can gain 20 to 30 degrees and retain our moisture and eliminate evaporative loss by having that, that mulch barrier there. We're using uh, these complex cover crop cocktails, mixtures of three to 13 different plants. It's kind of like having a good party. When you have a party, do you just invite all the dudes over that you know? Or is it funner when the girls come and maybe they bring some of their friends and maybe get some international students to come? And all of a sudden now, you've got a pretty fun party, right? That's a lot better than you and the guys sitting around watching Monday Night Football, I'm guessing. Well, these cocktails are kind of the same thing. The more things we put in there, the better it gets. Most of the problems that plague modern agriculture are really a result of a lack of diversity. Nature abhors a monocrop. Nowhere in nature do you see a monocrop. We're imposing our will on nature and her response to that over time is things like resistant weeds and bugs 